transferal of his um, of his bodily remains from was originally a grave in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral up into a new shrine that was designed for to encourage pilgrimage. Uh, but it's also the 850th anniversary of his death in 1170. Uh, and for to encourage pilgrimage. Thank you. I'd like to think about today. Um, we're going to look at a number of um, a number of manuscripts that survive in the Bodleian and, and elsewhere um, from from Thomas's life and from from the reception of his life. Thomas is really is one of the most fascinating medieval English figures. I mean, he's really an, an historian from the amount of material that survives from his life. A number of eyewitness accounts of what he said and did, and he's a figure that has been he has been interpreted in many different ways. And so I'd like to think too about how we can how today we can deal with a how we can address a church that I happen to live right next to um, that is dedicated to Thomas of Canterbury as he was known in his life and what he means as a figure today. So if you're not familiar with him, this is perhaps an image that is um, it probably fits your stereotypical conception of Thomas Beckett. He is, um, you can see this is from a, this is from a Bodleian manuscript, a book of ours is known as Queen Mary's Psalter. It's um, often thought to belong to um, Queen Mary. And um, so this is a very, this is certainly a very 16th century image. Here you can see Thomas um, saying a mass. He doesn't actually seem to have been saying a mass when he died. This is a later idea uh, with very, very 16th century style um, altar and a chalice there and then being um, killed by various knights and being stabbed on the head. Um, and that's certainly what uh, that, that's what boils down to on one level. Um, but the broader crisis that that came out of is comes up first of all out of the civil war in England in which Oxford played a small part. This was um, the civil war between Stephen and Matilda for over the succession of England, which resulted um, from the white ship disaster. This is a this is an illustration by Matthew Paris of that event, and this was a this is an event in which the um, the uh, a number of basically all the nobility of of of, uh, of England, including the heir to the throne, went down in in a in um, in a ship. You can think of it as sort of the medieval equivalent of the Titanic. This is supposed to be you know the fastest ship and and extraordinarily well equipped. Um, it went down in calm weather, and the result was years of fighting and instability and all sorts of de desperation from. Uh, really all, all over the country, higher taxes, not a very pleasant situation. This is, um, and then finally under Henry II, Thomas Beckett came into power. He was, he was from a, a, sort of a low born middle-class London family. This was a, this was a, he always took his, his background somewhat personally. And, um, but he, First of all, uh, came to uh, to some some prominence in the, the House of Theobald, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, and then he was he was sent by Theobald uh, to be um, to work in in the household of Henry II and became the Chancellor. Now he was uh, Thomas Becket was ordained a deacon. He wasn't he wasn't a priest at this point. This wasn't an, an unusual situation. Is very common for people to have to share clerical and um, clerical duties and positions in government. Now, um, Thomas did a reasonably good job as chancellor by all accounts. He was also known as being somewhat flamboyant. He um, he he wore fancy clothing. He loved falconry. Um, so he was sort of a. I, people often tend to think of him as has a bit of an an everyman, and it'd be a bit as if. And then he became Archbishop of Canterbury, and suddenly um, 
or perhaps gradually became a quite religious figure. It'd perhaps be a bit as if it actually, it'd be quite similar as if um, to the situation now, if you had the current chancellor um, who is, you know, a fairly well, well equipped um, in financial matters suddenly become the Archbishop of Canterbury. The monks of Christ Church Canterbury were not entirely pleased about it by all, all, all accounts, but, but in any case, Thomas was expected by Henry II initially to, um, it seems he was expected to take a basically hold the line for, for, the, uh, for the king and more or less do as, as the king told him to do as the archbishop and he would have the entire, the entire kingdom under his finger more or less, uh, but this didn't happen. Thomas had a change of heart. Um, one of the most famous issues that he clashed with the king over was that of the church's right to try clerics in its own courts. This is not something that today we would really see as a major issue, but um, so for example, if you were a if you were a medieval cleric and you say you murdered somebody, um, not all priests were nice people. And if you murdered somebody, then then in, in that situation, the church had the right to try you in a church court rather than um, in a secular court. Now that this at the time wasn't necessarily uh, viewed as a light sentence, but the key thing was that uh, whereas secular courts would often meet at the death sentence, church courts did not do this as a matter of policy. Now you can still see a relic of this if you go to, into the Bodleian Library and the Divinity School. This is on the screen, you can see the Chancellor's Court. This is this continued until the 19th century. The university had its own court um, in which this is this is a relic of, 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 the, um, of the right for clerics to be tried separately. So this is this is one one issue, but ultimately this this blew up into a whole series of various problems that more or less amounted to Henry II trying to to take control of, of the church within England, trying to almost separate it from um, to some extent from papal authority, attempting to um, in some sense to create um, is almost like a medieval version of Brexit, trying to create sort of this, this version of England that was sort of set off by a, a firewall from the rest of Europe. And so this is, uh, the, Henry increasingly came to be viewed as a tyrant, uh, in, to use a medieval term for, for what he did. And Thomas um, in various ways, uh, stood up to him. It's a very long story, but Thomas ended up fleeing into France. In response, Henry sent all of his rel relatives and friends into exile, also into France. Here you can see a, an illustration from a British library manuscript. And um, Thomas spent years in Pontigny, in this Cistercian Abbey. And here we actually have a number of very nice books that were created for Thomas during this period. Um, here's one that it's a glossed Pentateuch. Um, although the Cistercians are famously, uh, famously austere in their architecture, uh, this is a, he creates some absolutely beautiful books and, and Thomas seems to have had a, a, a taste for really nice looking books. So this is, uh, this is actually not, this is not a great picture. This is actually a slide from a, it's, it is a scan of a slide from the 1970s, but um, you can still get a sense of just how, how, how elaborate this book actually was. Here's another shot of the same book. This what you're seeing here by is a, um, you're seeing a biblical text in, in the large print in the middle and in your, on it around the edges. And so this is um, this is one of the ways in which Thomas finally had the chance to sit down and learn proper theology as the Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury, largely working under um, John of Salisbury and Herbert of Bosham. Here's a book that Herbert put together uh, for, for, for Thomas. This is a copy of the 
commentary of Peter Lombard on the Psalms. This is another Bodleian manuscript. And uh, again, you can see that this is, you have the large print in the middle, that that's, um, that's the, 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 uh, the text of the Psalm. And then you have commentary off to the sides. This particular book also has these delightful little figures. Um, here we have um, this, this little figure in the side, they'll, they'll sort of point at the text, they might be commenting on something going on here. Um, we have somebody saying, um, a man in fire, um, God in man. So there's all sorts of wonderful things left over from Thomas's own life. Uh, but to cut a long story short, um, eventually there, there's much haranguing for years between Thomas and Pope Alexander, and King Henry, and King Louis of France, all sorts of dynastic issues, but eventually um, Thomas was able to come up with some sort of settlement with the king. Um, he was tempted on many occasions to, uh, to excommunicate the king. He didn't, the, uh, there was this need on a political level to portray the king as just being as you know, not, not actually being, although in private Thomas referred to King Henry II as a complete tyrant. Um, in public, he just said, oh, he's being misled by these wolves at, at court. And you know, it's not really, not really the king that's evil. He's just, you know, there's also all these people surrounding him that are up to no good. And and so eventually um, they, they came up with settlement. Henry was constantly changing his mind and saying one thing that he'd accept a settlement and then not, and then doing something else in practice. He was an absolutely dreadful ruler. Um, and he, you know, he puts today's dictators to absolute shame um, in terms of the uh, you know, absolute disrespect he has for for other rulers, uh, for, his, for his underlings. Don't let anyone tell you that Henry II is, is a fun person to have around. In any case, um, Thomas um, eventually came back to England in 1169, it's in 1170, um, and he was absolutely, um, uh, the stories, stories go that he was hailed as a sort of a returning hero by, by uh, by the, the common people of England. Um, but you can see in this picture, also from that British Library manuscript, uh, that um, other people were not so happy about his return. You can see these knights sort of putting up their hands, perhaps in warning, perhaps in, um, perhaps in threat. Not quite, not quite clear what's going on here. Um, and Thomas, as you probably know, was eventually killed. This is the earliest depiction of Thomas's murder in a uh, in a British Library manuscript. This was made at Cirencester in the in the early 1180s, and so here we have Thomas um, in the final scene of his life uh, with the knight showing up um, as he was in as he was in his hall at Canterbury and um, being told that he was uh, not in the king's favor which uh, was perhaps a sur surprise to him as he declared. And then after, uh, after being chased around the cathedral for a, a short period, um, he took a stand in the church's nave and eventually had, um, eventually these four knights actually took their sword to his head and um, actually cut off the top of his, of his cranium initially. So you see that on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you see um, various pilgrims uh, then coming to his coming to his shrine, I believe. Um, and if if you ever think that a medieval manuscript can't be gory, we'll just take a slightly closer look here, because here you can actually see not only um, I think it it looks as if it's the end of the of the knight's sword falling down, but also the top of Thomas's cranium falling to the ground. Um, absolutely disgusting. Almost immediately, uh, there was a popular cult that rose up around Thomas. Thomas was uh, quite, um, Thomas had been widely criticized during his period as 
uh, for many for many of the actions that he took as Archbishop of Canterbury is widely recognized that he had made mistakes. Um, he was uh, viewed as a as a as Archbishop. He is viewed as relatively pious, but perhaps um, you know, but not as someone who might have obviously become a saint were it not for what actually happened to him. Because as somebody who was who was killed by uh, with, within a church for the cause of the church by a, a group of knights that made him a martyr. And as you can imagine, um, martyrs within Christianity are sort of the some of the um, dying for one's faith is, is within Christianity, one of the absolute highest callings. And, and but as you can imagine, uh, since Christianity became the dominant religion within Europe, this wasn't something that happened all that frequently. And so to have a new martyr within England uh, was something that was an absolute sensation. And there were, re there were reports of miracles occurring um, almost immediately after his death. There was one report uh, that somebody, that one person scooped up some blood of Thomas after immediately after he had been killed uh, is a man who then took some of the blood home um, to his wife, who then, um, who, who was paralyzed, but, but bathed in water mixed with his blood, absolutely disgusting. And, uh, and she was cured of her paralysis. And this became, uh, this became uh, the, the water of Canterbury Cathedral, uh, became a relic that people would take home that, and that the monks of Can Canterbury would, would manufacture. They would take uh, very small droplets of blood that, and then rinse it, um, rinse it through water. And so you, you would end up with, uh, in theory, this, this, um, this relic of St. Thomas's that one could take home. This manuscript, this is still the same manuscript. This is, um, again, this is, this is an example of what, what devotion people would put into this figure. This is an absolutely lavish manuscript. Let's take a slightly closer look of the letters of Thomas Beckett. Again, this is made at Sarah and Sester Abbey in Gloucestershire, not a place with really close connections to Thomas Beckett, but they, but they are approaching his, his letters as almost a uh, on the same level as say a patristic work, a work of say someone like Augustine that they would have actually absolutely revered in this period. Now there's much more to the story, um, but if you'd like to, if you'd like to hear more, uh, there's an absolutely wonderful book by John Guy called Thomas Beckett, don't be put off by the cover, but it really is um, an absolutely gripping story. There's also a very good book by Anne Duggan, uh, very slightly more academic. Um, Anne Duggan has also done, uh, she's edited the Letters of Thomas Beckett. Uh, she's done an, an absolutely huge amount of work to really, uh, which has actually completely reformed the way in which we think about this figure within the last, um, within the last 20 years, really. You can also find online a a uh, really great website called the Beckett story that was put up this year. And you might have seen in the news today that they, they, they made, I think, practically every newspaper today with this digital reconstruction of Thomas's shrine, which give you, gives you a sense of what the monks of Canterbury created in uh, 800 years ago today in, in 1220. So you can see that this is uh, this is a style of a shrine that ended up being hugely influential right across England. Um, you can see on the on the left hand side, you can see um, manuscripts that um, sort of, I believe that this is a believe, um, said to have been various miracles that occurred there. Um, you can see that there is absolutely lavishly decorated with jewels, with um, with solid gold, um, and then the martyr's body was placed up in a in a ferret area where nobody could um, nobody could disturb it. Now the taking taking pilgrimages to Canterbury uh, 
continued for the rest of the Middle Ages as an absolute sensation. This was supported um, initially by, by Henry II himself, although you might think that he would have been absolutely embarrassed beyond, beyond belief for by this cult. Um, he in fact decided to embrace it. Um, he, he famously, uh, a few years after, after the death of Thomas, he, although he didn't really take responsibility in a very, in a very sincere way, he famously went to Canterbury later on and walked to Thomas's tomb barefoot and was and was sort of scourged lightly by by the monks, which is sort of worse for his um, worse for his dignity than anything. Perhaps this is an example of a pilgrim badge, uh, such as your if you've read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. This is the sort of thing that um, this is probably made of pewter. This is in the it's in the British Museum from the 14th century, and this is a sort of uh, you might collect these little badges when you went on um, to show that you. That you actually went to a certain place. It's sort of the equivalent of uh, taking a little, um, sewing a flag to your backpack today, or if, you've, if you're a traveler. And of course, the other effect of all these pilgrimages is was a again a wider cult for Saint Thomas. And right with right within Oxford, there's Saint Thomas's Church that um, that we're thinking about today. St. Thomas's was originally a chapel of Osnia Abbey. This is one of the major, uh, one of the major communities of Augustinian canons in Oxford. It's not exactly clear. This, this church seems to have been created in the probably the, the late 11, 1180s, early 1190s. Um, it's really history is somewhat sketchy, but one suspects that presumably they would they would have had a relic of of St. Thomas. Um, and so perhaps it was viewed as, I suspect that they were likely trying to, um, probably trying to sort of become a minor pilgrimage site of their own. But what the cult of St. Thomas certainly inspired was their rival of St. Frideswide's Priory, which is now Christchurch. Now, Osney and Christchurch so Osney and St. Frideswides uh, were always at odds with each other throughout the 12th century. Uh, they, had, they both thought that they had the right to operate the parish of St. Mary Magdalene, um, which is of course still in Oxford. Um, the, that's another long story, but they, they quarreled over it. They both sent appeals to the Pope, um, all sorts of all sorts of back and forth there that that seems to have created all sorts of bad blood and St. Frideswides also um, seems to have been inspired to actually create a pilgrimage cult of St. Frideswide likely based off of what happened to um, to St. Thomas. This is a letter by Robert of Cricklade who knew St. Thomas in in his life and he uh, one of his most well-known, well-read books was a life of St. Frides of, of St. Thomas that doesn't actually survive, but does survive in a old Norse translation that was made in, um, in the early 13th century. So Robert was the prior of, of St. Frideswides. He was in charge of it from, um, from about 1139 until his death somewhere in the late 1170s. This is, uh, he went on a trip to Sicily in the late 1160s. And in that time, he seems to have picked up some sort of weird bug, um, perhaps resulting, he, he, he attributes it to the, to the bad winds from the sea. And so he takes a very typical approach to this. Initially, uh, he consults physicians, just like we would. Uh, we tend to, I think, assume that medieval people who believed in miracles were completely, were just completely illogical. But the fact is that, that miracles for, for medieval people were not something that one could rely on. It was still a, in many ways, a, a last resort if one couldn't either 
um, if one can afford a doctor or if one or if the or if medicine simply failed. So here's his experience of, so he, he, he picked up sort of this swelling disease in his legs, which sort of went, they, it came and went for, for several years until he finally went on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. And here's his experience. Now it came into my mind to go visit the tomb of the most blessed martyr Bishop Thomas, where I heard remarkable things of his martyrdom. And when I had come to Canterbury, the disease was made worse and the swelling increased by the length of my journey and the extent of my exertion. I threw myself down at his tomb, this is before the, of course, before the major translation, and prayed the Lord that he might free me from that sickness by the virtue of his martyr. I prayed the martyr that he might call on the Lord for me. Not knowing that I had been heard, I returned to my lodgings, anxious and groaning, because I did not know how I would be able to return to my own house for the excess of my pain. Finally, it came to me in my mind that I might anoint the foot with holy water given to me. I placed the foot in the basin and made the sign of the cross from the water itself over my foot and over my shin in the name of the Holy Trinity and in memory of the most blessed martyr, and I anointed both. I caused the rest to be thrown into the fire that it should not be trampled underfoot. On the morrow, when I was making a journey to my own region, I felt the pain lessened, an easing of the swelling. When I was in my lodgings at Rochester, I was greedy to see the easing that I felt. I caused my shoe to be removed, and yet I could not see my sight what I felt. From there, having faith of recovering my health, I anointed again in the same way. The next day, making my way to London, I felt the pain further subside and greater easing of the swelling. And when my shoe was taken off at London, I could see this well by sight. In the third day's journey, there was much easing and I felt little pain. When I come to Oxford, when I ought by custom to advance from bad to worse from day to day after completing such a journey, I found myself entirely healed. No trace of the abscesses or blisters or swellings were evident, except that some small redness was left on the skin. All the swelling was shaken off and all the pain driven out so that not only I was amazed, I who did not feel how I was healed through the hand of God's mercy and by the virtues of the most blessed martyr, but, any, but everyone who had seen my disease before marveled and glorified God and his most blessed martyr. So that's a letter that Robert of Cricolade wrote to Benedict of Peterborough, um, somewhere around 1171, and who was creating a, a, a collection of the miracles of St. Thomas as evidence for why Thomas ought to be, uh, um, ought to be canonized. So this gives you a uh, this gives you a sense of what an early experience of going to uh, going on a pilgrimage to Canterbury might have been like. Robert was also really keen on um, he, he continued to be very keen on Tom, Thomas Beckett not only writing a, a life of 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 Saint Thomas but um, if you if you are in Oxford. In the early 1170s, you probably would have also heard um, sermons referring to Thomas. Here's a collection of sermons on Ezekiel that Robert wrote, um, in which he refers to a number of times to, uh, to Thomas Beckett. But more significantly, this shrine of Thomas Beckett seems to have actually influenced the creation of a shrine of St. Frideswide at Christchurch. This is a this is another manuscript at, at the Bodleian, the Miracles of St. Frideswide that were written by Robert's successor, Prior Philip, a, somewhere between 1180 and 1183. This is a book that um, this is a book that interesting that uh, you can actually see was was used at the at, at the at the priory itself um, so here you can see this annotation in the margin that shows it was used for for reading purposes and so very similar to the translation that the monks of Christchurch later ha held 
for Thomas in, in 1220. They also held a big translation of Brideswide to sort of launch uh, the official cult of, um, of Brideswide. And there's, this is a record of a whole series of miracles that uh, that apparently took place in Oxford in this period, and a number of them refer to uh, to people perhaps uh, going to to Canterbury even, um, and then finding that St. Thomas couldn't heal them, but then they went to St. Brideswide, and there they had success. And so this seems to there seems to have been a bit of rivalry between them and and St. Thomas. It's interesting that at the translations, Henry II was actually present. Um, so although Henry II was actually quite supportive of the cult of St. Thomas, it's interesting that, it's perhaps interesting that um, he's also not, not opposed to having a bit of a, a rivalry set up between them, hard to interpret that for sure. Uh, but in, in any case, um, you can certainly see there's a lot of influence going on there. Interestingly, they also both modeled themselves architecturally off of um, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Here is, this is the Priory Seal that was created somewhere around 1190. Um, here's a slightly closer shot of it. What you can see is, is uh, this is supposed to be St. Fried's wide holding a, probably a pair of wax tablets in her left hand and, and then a, probably a lily in her right hand and, and that canopy that's over her head is an imitation of a of the canopy of the of the holy sepulchre um, which you can also see on this seal of the order of saint john of jerusalem and the funny thing is that the original design for thomas's shrine at canterbury cathedral was meant to have been modeled on the Holy Sepulchre as well. Uh, in the 1180s, there was a big fire at Canterbury Cathedral and the, uh, and so there's an architectural competition, perhaps a bit like the, if you've been following the reconstruction of Notre Dame, you remember that there was all these different ideas for the roof or well, similarly after the fire at Canterbury Cathedral, they, they held a competition for a new shrine of, of St. Thomas. Um, the winner, who is French, William of Saint, um, had this elaborate octagonal design that, was, that would have created this huge monument, um, again, modeled out on the Holy Sepulchre for St. Thomas. Uh, that was never finished because uh, there's another, there another collapse. William of Saint fell about 50 feet to the ground from the roof of Canterbury Cathedral and he survived but resigned the commission and that's part of why it took such a long time to have the final uh, translation of St. Thomas in 1220 and also why they didn't end up going with that design but, but you can see that there's um, obviously the same ideas between when it what ended up in Oxford and what ended up in uh, what was intended for Canterbury. So the, the cult of St. Thomas continued to be a quite significant, uh, quite, quite, a, a quite significant affair throughout the later Middle Ages. Um, here's another late medieval prayer book showing a very similar scene to the one that we saw at the beginning of these, of, the, of him being murdered again at, um, now at mass, even though that wasn't in the original accounts. Um, and, but in the 16th century, Henry VIII, although he was initially like anyone else, a supporter of the cult of Thomas Beckett, um, saw it as being a bit too close to home in criticizing what he was trying to do in separating the English church from papal authority. And so Henry VIII, ordered the removal of Thomas's names from any liturgical book, even before, uh, even before the Latin liturgy was actually abolished. So this is a very common thing to see in liturgical books. Here you can see a, um, this is, you could, it looks like it, it had said Thomas Martyr in, uh, in this calendar. This is a breviary that's in the Bodleian Library and then somebody has gone and 
scratched it out. Similarly, St. Thomas's Church in Oxford uh, ended up being renamed St. Nicholas Church, and there's still a stained glass window there that shows St. Nicholas. Uh, it seems that St. Nicholas was originally a chapel at Osney Abbey. Obviously, it ended up being uh, taking back its old name later on. Um, and in the 19th century, St. Thomas uh, was often often taken up as a uh, as a Catholic sympathizer, as a sort of a defender of the church. Um, here's a nice little picture of of uh, Beckett in a 19th century board game in the Bodleian collection. Uh, but that's not really a vision that perhaps inspires us today. And so what do we do with Thomas Beckett on, um, you know, how do, we, how do we deal with him as a, as a political figure and as somebody who inspired this giant cult of miracles? Well, the funny thing is that, although I think many of us would feel somewhat uncomfortable with the medieval approach to miraculous events, um, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, next year we're actually, the Bodleian's holding an exhibition on Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. This is a book that Robert Burton was a curate of St. Thomas's Ian, he was in charge of it in the, in the 17th century. He was also a fellow of Christ Church. Um, there's a lot to be said about this book, but the interesting thing is that the NHS today is, is um, this, this exhibition is being put on by a psychologist who is quite interested in, the, um, in how faith, faith healing can be understood on a scientific level as a legitimate part of modern healthcare. And so there's certainly, there's certainly more that, that can be done with, um, with the idea of, of medi medieval miracles. And as, you've, as I've pointed out in Robert's letter, it's not actually as weird as, um, as, as one might initially think. And it's also worth pointing out that, uh, that today we once again have some of the most prominent leaders of the world once again attempting to subvert religion for their own purposes, um, often in ways that would have put Henry II himself to shame. And so if we're thinking about um, Thomas of Canterbury as, no, certainly Thomas isn't somebody that, um, no, we can't get excited about the, the problems of uh, clerical or lay investiture or whether um, I think that most of us would not advocate um, having separate church courts, um, especially given recent events, um, especially given that um, there's no longer, you know, today we don't have to worry about courts imposing the death sentence on people, thankfully. Um, but at the same time, um, if we're thinking about Thomas as somebody who opposed what he viewed as tyranny, and opposed it with his um, up to um, up to his very death, um, at a time when many of his colleagues, such as um, people like John of Salisbury, for example, who's his um, close friend, who wrote a great deal about um, about this problem, but in the end was uh, in the end himself sought compromise on, and he was not in fact willing to. Uh, to go to the same death that Thomas did. And so this really is an absolutely remarkable and compelling figure, I think, for the modern age in ways that, um, in ways that we might not actually expect. So I think I'll, I'll leave you there. Um, and I'd be very happy to, to take questions about this. Um, again, this is um, an absolutely fascinating figure. I'd really recommend um, John, John Guise and, and Duggan's books on this. Um, there is almost no end of information on this figure. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you so much for that extraordinarily rich and, and amazingly researched um, presentation. It's, it was fascinating and um,
Uh, and so enlightening. Uh, so thank you. I wish we could virtually clap you, but uh, I certainly, I certainly I'm clapping loudly here. Um, one of the, I'll, I'll kick off with a question. One of the, the things that I, I ought to have, of course, um, realised, but, but well, I've only been here nearly two years, so it's, it's not that long, but realised that actually the, the cult of Frideswide um, played a part in, in a, a if I if I heard you correctly, it played a part in the the growing cult of Thomas Beckett in Oxford as a kind of political um, kind of competitive edge, really, between Osney and the Priory of Christchurch, which uh, doesn't surprise me, of course, because church church is as political as any other organisation, and, and 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 competing for for pilgrims was a was a big thing. So uh, thank you for 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 bringing that out, um, which I hadn't really thought of before um it, do you think that um i mean the the cult of thomas beckett was clearly um, a, a huge thing in that period of time mm. for Eng for the english christian um do you think i mean frideswide was a particularly oxonian um saint do you think that that, that thomas beckett's cult was on a par of St. Fried's Wide in, in Oxford for a time? Uh, in Oxford, maybe. Uh, but as he says, uh, St. the cult of St. Fried's Wide, although it's, um, so I, I do think there was, there's not direct evidence apart from, as, I, as I've mentioned, there's this, you know, there's, there's references to Thomas Beckett in these Fried's Wide miracles. Yes. Yes. Um, there's the fact that Robert of Cricklade, who seems to have instigated the whole idea yes. of it, the cult of yeah. St. Francis Wide was himself a devotee of, of Thomas Beckett. Um, so, but I, but it was very much limited. Although people did come from, from other areas, there's actually not a whole lot of evidence that, um, that it really had a really wide influence beyond Oxford itself. Um, it did, whereas the cult of Thomas Beckett on the other hand, um you know spread throughout throughout yeah. europe there is um you know there there's well well frescoes of yeah. victim thomas beckett and you know in in what's now germany in throughout in, in there's you know lives of thomas beckett in early versions of the they were written in poland this was an international phenomenon yes if any other questions for for Andrew, just unmute yourself and uh, uh, and and ask away. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, if you do have any other questions, oh. Um, if you do have any other questions, I'd really recommend the um, the British Museum is doing a big exhibition on on St. Thomas in it, it was originally scheduled to start in October. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not, of course, but um, it's still planned to go ahead. And so that uh, that promises they were working on that when I worked at the British Library and mm -hmm. in 2017, they were soliciting lists of things that we might have for them. So that's going to be an absolute um, blockbuster as it's um, certainly as they've planned it. And there was supposed to be a quite a large, well, year of pilgrimage really at, at Canterbury Cathedral this this year. Um, they mm -hmm. were in fact hoping to get, they may have already got it. In fact, the relic of, I think of his tunicle of, of, <laughs> of, of Thomas Beckett's tunicle. Um, and obviously that that has had to be postponed. So I think they're they're, they're going to try and do that next year. But uh, I mean, it would be a nice thing to for Oxford, St Thomas, and devotees to go to Canterbury. I think. Um, Hanika. Sorry, I was searching for the unmute button, but uh, ah. uh, I found it now. Uh, yes. Uh, well. First of all, I mean, thank you very much for the, the fascinating illustrated talk, because it, it is wonderful, of course, to get so many uh, uh, pictures of manuscripts uh, all together. Um, I have a sort of long 
well, a memory from very long ago, uh, from reading a life of life of, of Thomas Beckett. I can't even remember which one it was, uh, but a very striking detail, uh, which uh, leads me to reflect on um, the extent to which uh, Thomas Beckett became an example of um, devotion uh, to the extent of asceticism, uh, because when um, the uh, the um, the uh, the four villainous knights had departed, and and people came to recover the body. Um, it was found that he was wearing a hair shirt mm -hmm. that was crawling with vermin. Did you remember <laughs> that? Yes, that is the story. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Thomas Beckett is. Um, so this is the one of the funny. This is actually one of the people that tended to to uh, to argue. Some of the things people tended to argue about on um, sort of whether Thomas was just sort of a what was was he just sort of this person who just ended up being in the wrong time in the wrong place, or was he you know was he really a genuinely uh, devoted person, or as the Archbishop of Canterbury and. So taking up more ascetic practices does seem to, uh, to some hagiographers who viewed him, who portrayed him as, you know, he became Archbishop of Canterbury and just, then just had this sort of road to Damascus experience in which he just suddenly changed all of his ways. Um, in fact, the stories about him, um, you know, and the Lent after he had been enthroned as Archbishop of Canterbury, still deciding to, um, still deciding to eat pheasant during Lent, which of course you're not supposed to do. And um, however, it actually seems to have been his experience at Pontigny, um, in which he really uh, began to sort of discover asceticism, and. He uh, so he had this um, uh, so he you know he he really focused on study those manuscripts at the Baldian that I showed you um, are a result of that it was said that he would um, he would um, every day he would um, dip himself in freezing cold water this is a typical practice and is there that he is wearing this hair shirt in practice um, this was something that was only known supposedly to one or two of his of his assistants and then um and the and the monks at christ church who had again continued to be somewhat skeptical of him even after he'd been in exile for all those years and then finally returned um then after after he had been murdered he was his body was was moved up into um up, up by the high altar and then his 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 um over clothing was sort of pulled aside and they found this hair shirt that was said to be crawling with lice. And <laughs> everyone at that point thought, okay, this uh, this guy was serious. Yeah, okay. So yes, that, that is um, that is certainly a detail that, um, uh, that does seem to, that is certainly corroborated by the earliest sources. Um, there's one question um, that I got from Martin. Um, He's, he's asking, um, I think via YouTube. Um, oh, he, right. he, he says, he's, I wondered if Robert of Cricklade might be the reason why Siren Sister took an interest in the Beckett calls, uh, born, for, born nearby his first monastery, so maybe a family interest slash connection. Um, yeah, that's, I think, very plausible. Um, uh, Robert of Cricklade, yes, was a canon at Siren Sister up until 1139, and he, he moved to Oxford around that time. Um, that's quite possible. That particular manuscript is actually thought to have been, um, that I showed earlier, is thought to have been made at Canterbury originally, and then it was demonstrated um, in the 1980s that actually has the handwriting of, of canons at Siren Sister, and so it had to have been um, made there. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, is, um, that personal connection is certainly very, that's quite plausible. Um, but at the same time, everybody sort of wanted a piece of, of Thomas Beckett. Um, those, um, some of those images I showed you earlier of these, those lives of, of um, scenes from the life of Beckett that are now in, they're actually fragments called the Beckett Leaves that are in the British Library. 
Um, those are thought to have been also modeled after illustrations that, that Matthew Paris made of his life. Um, so even though um, in the 16th century, there was this active effort to try to destroy everything that was possibly related to Thomas Beckett. There's just so much of it that, um, that it just, there's still quite a lot that survives. Mm. Mm. Do we have any other questions or comments or reflections for Andrew? Well then, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's been a very, a very enlightening and uh, fascinating presentation and uh, really grateful to you for all of the, the hard work you've put into that. Um, I must say it's a, it's a real delight and pleasure to, to know somebody who works in the bodleian and uh, has such a, a keen interest in these, in these matters and, and who's involved in the, in the parish um, and who lives in the parish of St. Thomas the Martyr. That's one of the the great thing is that you are actually a geographical physical parishioner. Yes. <laughs> um, so we wish you well and uh, and thank you for, for, for taking the time to do this for us on this very special day. Thank you. And yes. thank you all for joining us and, uh, and God bless and, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you Enjoy. very much. Thanks, Andrew. Bye bye. <laughs>